Well, good morning. Welcome to Authors at Google in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Andrea Coville, who is CEO of Brodeur Partners here in Boston with offices uh, nationwide, worldwide? Excellent. Um, as CEO, as CEO, she has diversified Brodeur Partners from a PR firm specializing in technology to a multidisciplinary communications agency, focusing on full service communications, digital strategies, social change, and business consulting. Her passions include social issues that advance the well being of children. Today, she's here to discuss her recent book, Relevance, The Power to Change Minds and Behavior and Stay Ahead of the Competition. Um, I've read this book. It is definitely, in my opinion, a cut above all the other business books. Uh, has a lot to say on topics that um, are much more, pardon the phrase, relevant than one might think. Um, she points out that organizations spend billions of dollars annually in an attempt to win customers, move products, and enhance their brand image. However, um, many of these efforts are missing an essential element, relevance. Ms. Coville draws on original research and two decades of experience to offer organizations a road-tested plan for creating highly relevant messages that shift attitudes and, most importantly, consumer behavior. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Brodeur. Thank you so much for um, spending the, the next hour or so with me. Um, if I'd love just to ask you um, a little bit about yourselves. Um, anybody here from um, marketing? Product development? Maybe you, could, maybe you could tell me. Could you tell me some of the, what you do? Cool. <coughs> Neat. How about yourself? I'm in SRE, so it's also an engineering, although I've done the politics and the music working. Awesome. I'm an engineer working with partners, supporting our partners in the travel business. Oh, really interesting. I know that you are in the in the literary business. Well, but before that, I worked here. And Oh, cool. How about I'm in the global sales organization here, so very topical for us to yeah. talk about relevance with our clients getting lots of different messages and lots of different messages from us because we need so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also in global sales and working with companies uh, oftentimes to help them create a brand using new products. So. Great. Molly? Well, it is such a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, my name is Andy, and thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, and as my background has, I was I started out as a writer, got really interested by the importance of words, and then moved into marketing and, and actually public relations, which led me into the world of communications. And I think about six years ago, I had sort of this fundamental um, decision that I wanted to make, which was how to create more meaning in an industry that at times I felt could be a tad superficial. And as you know, you all are in the world of engineering and the importance of data high and analytics. And in my business in communications, as that business started shifting to really emphasizing the importance of that, I found that um, I found out that there's someone's phone, probably just, just knock it off yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, I found that there was less importance being placed. Do you mind just turning now? Well, thank you. It's my phone, so I can't blame her for that. <laughs> um, the, the, the lack of importance of putting the insight piece into the funnel was something I really wanted to spend some time on, and that was the original hypothesis when I began working on the book was, is, was it po there was this sort of thinking that communications could truly change behavior, but could we really push that? Can you think, can communications truly change behavior, or is it something that can support behavioral change? And the word relevance really appear, appealed to me because it's an old word. It's sort of like resilience. It's an old word that has, I felt, very powerful meaning. It's a word that sometimes advertisers 
would use as um, as as an index essentially, or as a as a metric. But to me, relevance is 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 a word. It has social and practical applicability. And you know, we have choices, right? We're in a world that is it's there's a real dual duality. I think in our environment today, we have the ability to select, yet we are saturated. Um, we have so much information coming at us. Why do we choose? the things we choose to engage in. Why do we choose them with so many options? And beyond that, why do we, beyond that, why do we actually stay engaged in them? Um, I always love thinking about communications in terms of, have you ever had a friend that did something you truly didn't expect that friend to do? Say that friend never went outside their comfort zone. They had a very, a, a life of ritual. But that friend all of a sudden went to a lecture, maybe once on Haiti, and decided, never traveled before, decided to actually jump on a plane, go to an orphanage, help out, um, help out in a, you know, almost like in a camping trip environment, and came back um, a completely, not changed person, but a, a really <coughs> a broadened person. I'm always fascinated by the insight that comes from a person, an idea, a company, a brand, that can, get, can open up people emotionally and get them to connect. So enter the relevant brand. What are, and what my research focused on was trying to look at some of the drivers of behavioral change. Are there emotional triggers that we can identify? And are there maps, connection points? And again, my business is, I'm, I'm an agency girl. I've grown up in agencies and communication, so I take this from a communications perspective. I'm not a behavioral psychologist. I'm a communications person. Our research started by asking people to self-identify. And we looked at the cohorts on the right, the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, the millennials. And I don't use those terms, those, those cohorts very often. But sometimes in terms of research like this, it just makes it easier. Um, we asked people to self-identify by age. And you think about things like risk taking and ambition. And that makes sense. The younger you are, or the middle part you are in your career, somewhere to 30 to 54, you're going to be more risky. Probably is true with your stock investments as well. Um, it's interesting to see how optimism changes. You tend to, from our research, this is six months old, tend to be a little more optimistic before you turn 55. But the one thing that united every age group that people self-identified with when chosen was compassion. So when you're thinking about a brand, and you're thinking about you're reaching an individual. Yes, you might be reaching an engineer. You might be reaching a doctor. You might be um, reaching a small business owner. But you are reaching a human being that in most circumstances <coughs> truly values that compassion is really relevant to them. So once you think about the fact of how people self-identify, you ask people, what is relevant to them personally? And this is a if we were on a webinar, I'd have you vote um, by you know clicking a button. Which of these do you think in our survey was the most important of these six? What do you think came out as top across all age groups? Make you, friends. you nailed it. Absolutely. So the next slide, you'll see important and relevant to you personally. Being understood collectively is probably the least important to all of us. Um, Making a difference starts getting really important. Staying healthy, of course. But personally, what we care about is that our friends and family and caring for them, not just caring for them in a healthcare sense, but caring for them emotionally is very, very important. And as you all know, I've seen the research, the only people that truly care where financial security moves up the list to the maybe the top, um, the top almost eighth is the wealthiest people care about being financially you know, secure. So if you make 170000 or more, you tend, to work, you tend to put the staying healthy and financially secure kind of go hand in hand. But um, so what we did was um, the, the research, and I'm going to get into a little bit more of it, and I want to show you some fresh research. I've only showed one other group before. Most companies and organizations really f um, focus on the upper right-hand side, the thinking side. Which is, you know, it makes a lot of sense. It's the rational, it's the functional piece of information. Helps make my needs, it helps my life, makes my life easier. I mean, if you just think about, as engineers, probably the way you received a lot of information, it's probably very data driven. I certainly, with um, physicians or surgeons, you're talking about outcomes, it's very, very specific. 
we started looking at how our data clustered, and it clustered into three other areas. Values, we started seeing people, especially if you look at the way a human being engages with a nonprofit, that's where your values as a human being connect to the organization. And you're going to see some data we have actually on your brand to Google the values are a very, very important part of your external brand. Um, the social, I don't mean social media here, I mean the social networks that we all bring, whether it's our bike club, our book club, our, um, where we, who we travel with, if, our, if we have children, you know, the PTA systems or our children's friends. It's the networks we bring to our environments. And sensory, this is the piece that has been done, I think has the most incredible potential in terms of communications. I mean, I, you know, I like to use this example of, of uh, as a category changer because what they did, you know, if you remember way early on, and your company is certainly doing a ton of this, is they brought a six sensor experience to a very, I would say, static technology. And there are tons and tons of companies out there, from medical device companies to pharmaceutical companies to consumer companies that have an, an incredible opportunity to explore the sensory element of engaging with people emotionally. And I think there's a tremendous amount of research. So some of the metrics we use in our, our research, and it correlates to the quadrants, are the following. So we look for, we look for things like values. Does it stand for the same things a human, you know, you do as a human being? If you're associated with a brand, how do you feel about yourself? You know, if you're a runner and you choose camel water packs and they're the certain size and they fit when you run, what does that say about you? Um, it helps me meet my needs, makes my life easier. There's that whole functional aspect. It's not for everyone, but it's for people like me. And it inspires me. And remembering at the center of all of this are individuals that care about their family and friends and are, are compassionate. So there's different relevance engagement pathways for different types of products we found. Personal products, um, it makes a lot of sense, you know, and personal products would be, would be, a, would be a smartphone or could even be a, a, a razor, but you associate it with the values are, that are important, but most of all, it, it really meets your needs. There's a functional aspect to it. High-end pro um, products like um, cars, luxury goods, or you know, not necessarily luxury cars, but maybe that's a choice. Whether you're a Zipcar um, uh, consumer or you buy your own car, part of it is something about wanting people to know that you're associated with it and um, it meets your needs. Professional services, um, very, very all about making your life easier, thinking about your relationship with your accountant. Again, these are where the drivers of relevance um, kind of burst. There are, but the opportunity is to look where the um, shorter drivers of relevance are, and is there an opportunity to explore those? And certainly with charitable organizations, you can see that the charitable organizations are very value-based, values-based in terms of their branding, communications. But the data we just did, and I'll show you this in a, more, in a minute, that the functional side, people are caring more and more about the return on their donation. Even if it's $10, they want to know it goes somewhere. Um, so here's some interesting data when you start thinking for, from our perspective about category lo loyalty. All problems in the world can be solved if you bring people together for food and drink. I guess that's sort of the number one thing. Everybody thinks and is loyal to food and drink brands. Um, number one category loyalty. News and information comes second. And way down, down at the end, end is automobiles. Um, and with the exception of consumer electronics, um, it's pretty evenly skewed, um, brand loyalty between men and women of all ages. Then you kind of, kind of look at um, category le um, level against age, against different demographics. And what's interesting to me is that news and information um, sources in the 18 to 24 cohort and the 65 plus are equally, are, are have a lot in common, um, and certainly I would say the the uh, the Gen X, the Gen Xers, the Gen Yers, um, food and drink are really key. But it's interesting to see the media consumption so important at both ends of the of the age of the age axis here. Um, if you look at, at this across ethnicities, you can see the ranking order of category loyalty going from left to right, where food and drink, you know, there's the most across all ethnicities, going down to automobiles, where, which is um, the, la the least um, 
uh, category loyalty, although Caucasians have the highest loyalty to automobiles. And um, African Americans skew the highest in terms of news and information sources. Okay. Yes. Would you mind explaining what um, uh, brands or category loyalty means exactly um, here for food and drink or news? It means that they have I, I, those questions that I showed you a couple slides about. They have answered those questions, and they've also indicated that they will um, stay, they care most. We ask them, uh, out of all of these categories, what do you care most about, and what do you change your preference, preferences about least? So you don't switch, like you, your favorite restaurants, your favorite beers. You stay loyal to them over a period of time. So again, here's here a little bit more about this. Among the organizations, if you're looking at relevance prof profiles of organizations, we asked people again in our research, what organizations most share your values? And this is where Google comes up. Is it the most ex interesting and exciting out of people we would put or companies we put in your category? Who would you miss most if you were gone? And who would you like to do business with? So this is six months um, data. And you can see that, I don't think it would surprise you, uh, um, that Microsoft has sort of this a lot of, you know, just from um, for decades, a sort of embedded brand um, relevance in in uh, in corporations. Um, Apple, certainly through its, um, you know, it's it's in the in the Steve and Jobs era, really really um, sort of created this uh, this people you know thought of them as the most interesting. But what was so interesting to us about the Google um, responses were that. People would miss you the most, and I think if it's just if it's if people haven't even experienced any other product other than just search, if you ask people if you took the ability to do Google search out of your daily life, what would your life be like? And people say I couldn't stand it. We couldn't. We would we would completely miss it. And even if that's the only entry point they have into your brand, the other interesting thing about of this was that um, the, the the values piece, the values, um, the company. I see my own personal values and the way the company behaves and brands. And that was very, very strong for Google as well. So we, um, looking at another, um, we're looking at now brand ambassadors. And those are people who go out of their way to create a positive impression of your brand with others. Um, th these are male and female. And it's interesting, with the exception of Intel and HP, um, most of the brand ambassadors skew female. If you look at income, you can see that what I found interesting here is some of the best brand ambassadors actually make the least um, amount of money in terms of brand ambassadors. So they go out of their way to communicate their, their brand preferences. Um, yeah. How do you identify brand ambassadors? Brand? Yeah, ambassadors. They will, uh, they commit to word of mouth, They're, they they will commit to a word of mouth action on behalf of, of a brand and behaviors that show they share and endorse the brand, like for example, c communicating about the experience on their social media networks throughout their communities. Right. Yeah, it's the difference between liking a brand and then liking it so much that you want to talk to them. Exactly. So this looks at it, you know, and it's, you know, never underestimate those group of people, whether they're younger, or they make the least amount of money that are using your products, um, they'll be making more money probably before long. And they're very, very, very powerful brand amb ambassadors for your brand in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, then we looked at, this is sort of interesting, um, uh, organization relevance. If you look at the, co the communities people belong to um, outside of work, um, are, there, are they particularly loyal to any kinds of civic organ organizations or they go to a weekly, war, you know, they have a religious affiliation or they think government is doing a good job? And it, I guess it's pretty clear that, um, that Blackberry, uh, Blackberry brand ambassadors feel that government is doing a good job and Microsoft has a lot of people that belong to a civic organization. It's just interesting to see where they work and where they play or what they think about outside. Now you can apply this to any market segment. And I'm going to show you in a, in, a, in a minute some very fresh data around law, law firms and banking institutions and higher education. But in retail stores, when we did this survey and then we redid it within a, uh, 
24-month period of time. Target has not changed, and you would have thought that Target would have been impacted by the security breaches in a, in a really um, a negative way. But I think the Target was is so relevant to people on so many levels. I mean, it's fun to go in there. It's a sensory experience. It's easy to find. You can grab some food. Um, you can get good bargains. It's fun. Um, they've, they have a lot of goodwill that has been associated with that at a retail level. I think that has really car carried over and carry them through this. And people aren't willing to give up that experience even for you know, some of the security breaches. Our next realm of, um, next cut of data is looking at, can you look at drivers of relevance and um, look at increases in market cap over time? Does it make a difference? That's our next, next and it'll be interesting to look at Target and Walmart um, two years from now and see if there are financial analytics that correspond to drivers of um, wellness. Now, we were talking about Comcast earlier before the talk started, and um, I would say that telecommunications is a pretty tough industry to differentiate in. If, if you're head of marketing for a telecommunications <coughs> industry, it's, it's challenging, but clearly um, Verizon, whether it's through some of their corporate partnerships, whether it's through the product line that they offer, whether it's through their storefronts, their retail operations, they have, more, they have significantly more drivers of relevance than a competition. Beverage companies, another look at relevance. Um, again, this is a blend of all cohorts because if you were just looking at millennials, you'd probably see Red Bull be completely off the page. Um, but um, what's interesting about Red Bull <coughs> is the most interesting driver. Certainly, if you look at some of the ways they engage their target audience, they do really fun, colorful, extreme events. People, people very clearly associate with them with being one of the most interesting co um, companies. And Coca-Cola, if you're thinking about an industry which is flavored water, right? I mean, we're all with a secret formula, of course. Coca-Cola has done a good job, a very good job across decades of maintaining its brand leadership. So you can start digging into and using all those metrics that I showed you a few screens ago, men and women, ethnicities, income, and you can start asking lots of questions. Start really, I mean, talk about a sensory experience. Probably, you know, drinking a beverage is one of the most sensory experiences you'll have. And you saw the data that showed that category lo loyalty to uh, food and beverages are extremely high. It's number one among all respondents. People stay loyal to Coke. You can look at nonprofits. Um, I love, I kind of love this story about the American Cancer Society because if you think of all of the nonprofits, um, they're dealing with a pretty tough subject. They're dealing with cancer. So how do you, you know, make the number one killer of people in the mid, in their, in their mid, middle years or even younger years, how do you engage people other than, you know, out of fear or, or sadness because they've been a survivor or they have a family member that's experienced cancer? Well, they've done a particularly great way, a great job of get, about getting people into the business of celebrating birthdays and getting people to um, fight cancer by, by donating funds or by walking a relay race or doing something positive to celebrate someone's birthday that they love, whether they're here, it's themselves, someone who's no longer here, or it's a family member. So it's taking a very, very tough subject and making it very relevant to people to do something about in a positive way. So they do, they do a great job at that. So um, this is some of the new research that I wanted to show you. Um, we asked people, um, this is probably two weeks old, why people, why they're loyal to brands, charities, and political causes. So again, we went back to the questions about values. Does it stand, does the, does the cause stand for something that's important to me? Is it social? Does it make me feel good to support it? Is it functional? Does it meet needs? And sensory. Um, it's not for everyone, but it's special for me. There's something about my emotional makeup that makes me connect to it, and it inspires me. So the data, the new data shows that when, you're lo when a product or service, and you think about that data I showed you earlier, which were high-end products or lower-end products, personal products, function was very important in that um, first, um, first um, classification of data. But now the sensory and emotive piece because um, starts to take over. So people are starting to say for the first time, it makes me feel good to support it. So if you're an engineer and you're developing a consumer product, it's really interesting to think not only on the functional aspects of that product, but wow, 
can you imagine the person that you're designing it for is actually going to say, I connect to that personally. I feel really good about supporting it. And using it inspires me. The next is um, the data that came out about charities. And I, I preempted myself by saying, definitely, it's all about <coughs> my personal values. But there has to be a functional side to it. And you see this with a lot of community foundations, um, foundations all over the, the world. I mean, they're helping a lot of people, but people are starting to look at new, new kind of generations of foundations. How are we actually creating sustainable, sustainable practices with the people that we are giving to? So you know that, that great work keeps um, propagating itself. Really interesting. This is sort of explains to me the sort of the state of affairs on politics. But people, what's really important to people is when they vote for a candidate is they like them. Um, when it gets down to the functional side, when you start talking about what's their track record, you know, you really start looking into their backgrounds. You'd think a lot of people would really concentrate on the fun functional aspects. The data is showing people look at candidates and say. I like them. I like the way they, I mean, they, they seem, they, it stands for the same things I do. Um, it, I associate it with values that are important to me. It's a very, very um, values ethics driven. And you can see why the divides exist are amongst parties because there's so many different slices of values and ethics in our, in our nation. So if you take a look at collapsing the three elements on this slide, you can see that different Different sectors have different balances, different quadrant balances of relevance. But there's such an opportunity. And they're balanced for a good reason. So my, my argument is I do not, I'm not suggesting you know, make all quadrants equal. I'm not suggesting don't lead where your strength is. But what I'm suggesting are that there are insights that you can find from the other three quadrants that can add trem a tremendous emotional dimension to the um, to the creative product that you're putting out there for people. And I think we're beginning to see that the analytics and the, d the data do support creating an insight that is tremendously unique and that's derived from a very holistic look at a person rather than just a functional look at a person. So here's some new, fresh new data. It's law firm. You're thinking about a law firm. You, you're, in the, you're in the room with your parents. Um, you both are thinking, well, the firm I choose will be the one with the most successful track record, with the greatest clients, the greatest number of cases won. Um, is it a firm that I know? Is it one I can personally trust? Um, the firm, is it a social? So for example, is it a, does it have a really good track record with social causes? Um, is it recommended by a friend or a family member or someone in my business? And, or is finding a relationship inside a firm with someone that's really committed to helping me have a successful outcome. That emotion sort of falls, falls more in the sensory bucket. And it's really interesting to say that um, the whole, the red quadrant, um, lower right, is the firm I choose will be the one I can personally trust. 37% that was important to. 27% was, was the firm that was, and this is collectively, um, was the firm that helped the individual achieve a successful outcome. The firm I choose will be the one recommended by another person. And then finally, the, the track record. But it's interesting, the youngest people in our survey cared about the track record the most. And the older people, um, <coughs> especially in the 55 to 64 year old range, really cared about the commitment to the outcome. So the lesson for us as branders and marketers is relevance changes. Relevance changes as your, it, it's circumstantial. It changes with how your life goes. Um, and it changes with, with different situations. It's very situational. But you know the things, um, and you'll see also in banking, that there's a trend to, in the early parts of our lives, we're thinking about maximizing returns all the time our data started to show that people would actually forego a dollar of profit for a long-standing relationship and with a financial institution that cared about you across your lifetime. So again, we asked them the same sorts of questions. I just gave you a sneak peek into this. Um, the, the two leading um, quadrants were one about firms I know are used by people I trust and respect, so word of mouth 
very, very important in financial services. And the second one was saving money. Um, the, uh, the digital um, ease of use was the smallest slice, but most important, you'll see, to the youngest audience. And then this, um, the, red, the red part, became very, very important to people as they age. So you can see how the data kind of, um, this, this chart explains what I just said. So I don't know if any of you got, are in this room are still paying off college loans. I know I'm a parent. I have three boys in college. Um, I was really fascinated with the results of this, of this survey. So we're, if you're thinking about choosing a college, and we look, again, same age spectrum, what do you care about? Do you care about a learning experience that can help you prepare for a career? Do you care about a learning experience that socially connects you to other people? Is it your network you get when you graduate? Is it about an experience that changes or shapes your values? And is, or is it about just something that creates an overall positive experience? Well, unequivocally, getting a job Having an experience that leads to a successful outcome where you are employed is incredibly important. It's incredibly important to people who are in college, who have recently graduated from college, or who are currently paying for their kids' college, or you know, who are you're paying off your loans. So again, looking at you know, ten years ago, I think this would have been very, very different. I think the social networks, if we had done this, would have been very, very important. Who you know, who you meet. Are, those are the tickets to getting you a job later in life. So again, this is the breakdown. This shows how you know the, a college university or learning experience can prepare you for a career. Clearly the leading indicator across all age cohorts. Pretty interesting. So I've told you this is survey work. So this is a lot of marketing survey work. There are also pieces of relevance that you can get, which I just call that are circumstantially. And you know, we look across one of the tools we have. It's a software product that recognizes keywords or phrases. So we can work, look across the social um, platforms. And for example, if we're looking for, working for a luxury good hotel, we can see how people, words or phrases that are used in conversation or dialogue that are associated with Hilton, that are associated with the Four Seasons, that might be associated with the Ritz Carlton. And I use this example because it's um, we found a very, very interesting insight. We were looking at luxury categories. We had done our qualitative and quantitative research. We'd done all the relevance profiles. We saw this comment that just kept cropping up about Ritz-Carlton hotels. And the online dialogue, the words and phrases, were all talking about the water temperature and pressure of Ritz-Carlton hotels. And they said, if you are a business traveler, you have got to step there. Stay at a Ritz Carlton. There's no better shower in the world if you're traveling. It's the temperature. It's the pressure. It's better than the coffee or the great smelling lobby or the soft towels or whatever it is. It's the water temperature pressure. You would have never have thought of that, you know, when you were doing your IDIs and interviewing people about why they choose hotel brands. And that's an that's an insight that it's very situational that comes up out of nowhere. And you have to allow for that in your branding process, you have to allow for stuff that isn't structured to come up, because some of the greatest bits of creativity come from that. So how this all works is you go through, you go through a methodology that tries to get at the very unique insights, um, slicing and dicing it every way I showed you the data. Once you have a couple of insights you want to test, you can use this M3 methodology that, we, that um, we, we, we've developed with our partner, which just allows you, it's an al algorithm, and allows you to, cho to choose your favorite choice and your least favorite choice. So you'd get 16 screens of a choice. This most reflects my preference, this least reflects. And what it allows you to do is find the precise mix of messages that support your insight, that get you the maximum reach. So for example, I would be able to figure out, once I knew, knew something more about you, what four combinations of messages I might need to communicate to you to sell you a new bike, for example, or a new camera. Those, you can get very, very specific with it. And it gives you, I mean, it, it takes some of the risk out of it. And you can see here, this is an example of just the sample size, how it changes when, you've, when you test the messages. The other lesson is people think 
you know, it's really easy for people that are driving brands or they make products to assume that they think they know what the messages are and you learn so much about testing with just asking people because some, some, sometimes the things you assume are gonna be correct aren't. So, I mean, at the end of the day, um, this is sort of towards the end of things. We've done this with a bunch of clients over the last 25 years from financial services companies to medical device companies that are introducing power sutures to pharmaceutical companies to nonprofits. Um, and relevance, if I could tell you seven things that are really important. And this can be true for building personal relevance, like in your job or your team, is the breast brands are movements, not products. They're the things that you spark an insight that gets people to capture it, and then they carry it forward. Those are the best brands. They don't, they're not dependent on you putting that content out there all the time. People create the content for themselves. They help people tell their stories. And every, there are people, everybody has different stories, but there are people that respond, there are communities of people that love and respond to uh, stories in different ways. The, um, relevance, relevance achieves that. Making people feel better, not worse. Having meaning in this world, even if you're talking about cancer, you have to give people something that touches the, their compassion, their ability to care for friends and family. They don't want to feel worse <laughs> than they already do. They want to make new connections, expands, they, it's, there's something expansive about it. It's easy and it's fun to self-identify with a brand. You feel like that brand is connecting to you. I mean, I think Chobani does a really great job of that. For a pretty broad-based consumer brand, Chobani does an awesome job about speaking to people where they are. They know who they're trying to reach, and they do a good job. And ultimately, you're meeting a need, and you're solving a problem. I've told you, you know, about the work that the American Cancer Society does. That's a great example of relevance. The second one I would just talk to you is a little bit, you know, the Ocean Conservancy. Here's an example of how relevance can make a difference. They were struggling with their donations. Um, they wanted to get their capital campaign or their annual gift giving campaign. It wasn't where they wanted it to be. And their messaging was great. Their website was great. <coughs> but it wasn't doing the job. And what they found through their research was that instead of talking to people about the ocean's health, like you should care about the Atlantic Ocean because the beaches are cleaner and there's better fishing and there's no trash and marine life survives. When people started connecting the ocean's health to their personal health, that was the oh aha. It's like, if that estuary gets sick, you get sick. If the water doesn't work on our planet, that's an enormous problem. And if you use the, 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 the right combination of messages, A, to get people to care, to inspire them, to connect with them, that makes a huge difference. So that turned out to be the message, the connecting the ocean's health with personal health that made the difference, and the, and the analytics and the data behind the campaign showed that. So that's a fast look, kind of a run through of what relevance in the book, and the book is a lot more about stories than from our, my experience in business and working with clients. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet you and to share it. Any questions? I agree, and that's why I started it the way I did, because I think people start self-selecting just when they begin their day about what they want to do. So in this day and age, to be able to connect with you, which for, from the starting point, you have to be relevant. That's the point. First of all, you have to have know enough about you or a brand that would appeal to you to get that to break through. And you know, it's going to get, it's going to get more intense, not less intense. And I think that's the thing that brands need to understand. The power, the power of just creating more and more information for us at every, I mean, pretty, you know, I'm sure it will be in every device we use, there'll be some ability to interact with content. That content has to be relevant. And the other point is, you can't assume you are relevant. I think the biggest mistake companies make are they assume they have a great conversation with their clients. They assume they, or their customers, they know what they want. 
and they don't. And it's really hard to regain relevance once you've lost it. If you make a, you know, if you're making an assumption that apps aren't important in a business environment, and you're developing products. That's a tough, tough thing to come back from, you know. So it's listening to people, listening to lots of people, looking for unconventional wisdoms and insights. You know, whoever came up with a zip car idea, what a what a great thing. If you think about an unconventional wisdom in a pretty conventional market, great example. Thank you.